Go ahead, counsel. Thank you, your honor. Ladies and gentlemen, we left off before the break, we were talking about Mr. Jackson's finances, his state of financial peril, what was going on at the time on the third, and then what happened thereafter and the fact that there was a great deal of money that had been generated. None of that money went to pay any of his creditors. That money was deposited on his behalf. There was over $2 million that went to an account in New York on his behalf. There was an additional $1 million check that was cashed for cash. And that was done on the 2nd of April and that was for Michael Jackson as well. There was all indication that he was in no way being victimized by anybody who was working for him. There were probably plenty of people who were working for him who are vying for higher positions on that ladder and who wanted to be a little closer to Michael Jackson, because that's a profitable place to be, certainly. But there's no indication, no evidence, when there could have been, that there was thievery going on or any stealing from Michael Jackson at all. Jason Francia. Jason Francia, as we had talked about earlier, young man, deeply religious young man, with a great deal of difficulty testifying on the witness stand, questioned on many occasions by Mr. Mesereau asking about inappropriate tickling, much in the same way that he referred to the conduct with Jason Francia as inappropriate tickling in his closing argument. Jason, you will remember eventually on cross-examination in some degree of exasperation, finally said, you mean when he played with my balls, was the answer. This was, to Jason Francia, not inappropriate tickling. It was child molestation. He may not have understood that at age 10, but he most assuredly understands it at age 24, and I believe all of you do as well. There was a lot of commentary, of course, about Janet Arvizo and the kids all lying, because they said they had not talked with one another about this case, and particularly that Janet Arvizo was lying when she talked about holding hands, her son holding hands with Michael Jackson. That's not inconsistent. Janet Arvizo testified that she had seen clips on television, on the news, of that documentary. She never watched the documentary, but she had seen clips. And many of those clips featured her son, who she said she recognized, and depicted particularly that one scene of him resting the head on the shoulder and holding the hands of Michael Jackson. She certainly would have known about that without having watched the actual documentary. As well, the kids having testified that they did not discuss their testimony with one another, they've been instructed not to discuss their testimony with one another. That is not unusual either. And in fact, is consistent with everything that you had heard, that kids don't like talking about such things. Rarely tell their family, rarely tell their parents. Rarely discuss the intimacies of those kinds of details. Now, it's a rather vague question, but the question is, did you discuss the case with other people? Does that mean did you discuss what you were going to wear for court, or whether you had to be in court, or whether you had to be in Santa Maria, or whether you could be back at home? That's discussing the case on some level. And certainly to that extent, they probably had discussions. It's a very vague question. But the question of whether or not they actually sat down and talked about their testimony, what they were asked or what they said, they were asked not to do that, and in all likelihood they didn't. That's not necessarily the type of thing they want to rush into. Janet Arvizo is not the sophisticate that Mr. Mesereau would like you to believe. She's a person who's not well educated, does not speak well, does not present well, does not function necessarily well in the workplace, as a victim of 16 years of domestic abuse. And you see it. You see it in how she presents. You see it in her personality. The notion that she is sophisticated enough that she would be able to come into court and stage this kind of vast fraud, including all of the details that we've talked about in the course of this trial. I mean, the details that can easily be disputed, if in fact it was made up, who was present at different times, different things, different pieces of information or evidence, the fingerprints on the sexually explicit magazines, the presence of the doll. I mean, to be able to keep straight such things as him presenting himself naked on a particular occasion. They don't exaggerate it. They don't exaggerate it at all. They simply say, he came in, he had no clothes on. At one point he said, this is natural. It's okay. Exactly the type of thing that you would expect in a grooming process. Nothing is exaggerated. Nothing is made up. The amount of detail that went into their testimony as they were on the witness stand for days at a time, and subjected to days of cross-examination, days. You got treated to about 10 minutes of inconsistent testimony out of two days of cross-examination and three days of total testimony as to each one of those children. And Janet Arvizo was on the witness stand for four days. That's a combined 13 days of testimony. 
and you got about 40 minutes of inconsistent statements out of 12 days of testimony. Their testimony was really rather remarkably consistent and it made sense, given what we know. It made sense, given the level of corroboration that we've been able to establish. We found the passports. We found all of the documentation. Ultimately the passports were in Mr. Garrigus's office, something that he did not talk about in his closing argument, Mark Garrigus, for good reason. We found all of the documentation of the visas, found all of the documentation. Everything that she was saying that had happened we were ultimately able to confirm. That she left the ranch at 2 o'clock in the morning we were able to confirm from the logs. That it was Jesus who took her out we were able to confirm from the logs. As you go through your deliberations, you stop and ask yourself, with every single piece of information, how could they make that up? How could they make that up and keep the story straight like that? She doesn't have that level of capability. Janet Arvizo, frankly, can't string two consecutive sentences together that make sense. But yet she is somehow going to convince her children to engage in this elaborate fraud because they might someday make a lot of money, and we know that's not true. In fact, Larry Feldman and Chris Kalman both gave testimony that they settled those cases back in 1993, before the advent of the criminal investigation, which would make sense. Michael Jackson's running out of money anyway. Now, it took some effort to go ahead and get this family to Santa Barbara. And in fact, the testimony of Steve Robel on the witness stand was this. You have victims that are terrified in coming forward to law enforcement. That is to reassure them that they are not the suspects or they're not the victims in this case. And he goes on to say, and I was reassuring them through that and letting them know that they are doing the right thing, because they are terrified when they come forward. And it took us about two weeks to get them to come forward and up here to be interviewed. Now, that is not the sign or the indication or the behavior of a family that is looking to, quick, grab the spotlight and cash this into money. It is a family that's frightened about taking on Michael Jackson and all who work for him, and subjecting themselves to this kind of ordeal. And now I'd like to play for you about 6 minutes and 40 seconds of that first interview where he discloses what happened to him. Input 4. Your Honor, Input 4, please. Whereupon, a portion of a DVD. People's Exhibit 900, was played for the court and jury. You just witnessed the seven worst minutes of this young man's life, 13 years old, and you saw him disclose for the first time that he had been molested by Michael Jackson, a person that he had been close to, a person that he had loved, a person who had been a very important person in his life. Mr. Mesereau has told you that that child made all that up and that is all an act. That's a product of having been in an acting class some number of years prior. I'm telling you that your common sense will tell you otherwise. This is an absolutely sincere revelation by this child that he had been sexually abused by a man that he had been previously close to. And his behavior here is completely consistent with exactly what you would expect a child to endure in disclosing this kind of offense. Ladies and gentlemen, my closing argument is concluded. I'm telling you now that, as you go back in deliberation, you're going to discover something. You're going to discover, as the twelve of you get together and begin your deliberations, that the collective wisdom that you're going to generate far exceeds the sum of its parts. You're going to find it amazing, when you start talking among yourselves and looking at the evidence, as you'll have to do, the revelations for you, what you'll be able to discover in this case that you had previously not even thought about, and you'll find that it will be quite possible to achieve justice in this case. And you will find, as you deliberate, that these accusations are not false, that these accusations are entirely accurate, entirely appropriate, and in fact entirely truthful. And we'll ask you to go back and begin your deliberations in this case and return guilty verdicts as to all counts against Michael Jackson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zonin. I have not intended, by anything I have said or done, or by any question that I have asked, or by any ruling that I may have made, to intimate or suggest what you should find to be the facts, or that I believe or disbelieve any witness. If anything I have done or said has seemed to so indicate, you will disregard it and form your own conclusion. The people and the defendant are entitled to the individual opinion of each juror. Each of you must consider the evidence for the purpose of reaching a verdict, if you can do so. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but should do so only after discussing the evidence and instructions with the other jurors. Do not hesitate to change an opinion if you are convinced it is wrong. However, do not decide any question in a particular way because a majority of the jurors or any of them favor that decision. 
do not decide any issue in this case by the flip of a coin or by any other chance determination. The attitude and conduct of jurors at all times are very important. It is rarely helpful for a juror at the beginning of deliberations to express an emphatic opinion on the case or to announce a determination to stand for a certain verdict. When one does that at the outset, a sense of pride may be aroused, and one may hesitate to change a position, even if shown that it is wrong. Remember that you are not partisans or advocates in this matter. You are the impartial judges of the facts. During deliberations, any question or request you may have should be addressed to the court on a form that will be provided. If there is any disagreement as the actual testimony, you have the right, if you choose, to request a read back by the reporter. You may request a partial or total read back, but any read back should be a fair representation of that evidence. If a read back of testimony is requested, the reporter will delete objections rulings and sidebar conferences so that you will hear only the evidence that was actually presented. Please understand that counsel must first be contacted and it may take time to provide a response or read back. Continue deliberating until you are called back into the courtroom. Do not disclose to anyone outside the jury, not even to me or any member of my staff, either orally or in writing, how you may be divided numerically in your balloting as to any issue unless I specifically direct otherwise. In this case, the defendant has been charged with one count of conspiracy, four counts of lewd act upon a child, one count of attempted lewd act upon a child, and four counts of administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, all felonies. You will be given separate verdict forms encompassing each of the charged crimes, and forms on which to record certain special findings in connection with counts 1 and 2 through 5. Since the lesser offense is included in the greater, you are instructed that if you find the defendant guilty of the greater offenses, you should not complete the verdict on the corresponding lesser offense, and that the verdict should be returned to the court unsigned by the foreperson. If you find the defendant not guilty of the felonies charged, you then need to complete the verdict on the lesser included offense by determining whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the lesser included crime, and the corresponding verdict form should be completed and returned to the court signed by the foreperson. You shall now retire and select one of your number to act as a foreperson. He or she will preside over your deliberations. In order to reach verdicts, all 12 jurors must agree to the decision and to any finding you have been instructed to include in your verdict. As soon as you have agreed upon a verdict, so that, when polled, each may state truthfully that the verdict expresses his or her vote, have them dated and signed by your foreperson. A caveat there. The foreperson would place their number as their signature, not actually their name. When you reach a verdict as to any particular count, place all verdict forms for that count in a sealed envelope, which will be held by the clerk until verdicts on all counts have been reached. At that time, the sealed verdicts will be returned to the foreperson, and the jury will return with them to this courtroom. Also return any unsigned forms. Before and within 90 days of your discharge as a juror in this matter, you must not request, accept, agree to accept or discuss with any person receiving or accepting any payment or benefit in consideration for supplying any information concerning the trial. It's the next one. You must promptly report to the court any incident within your knowledge involving an attempt by any person either to improperly influence any member of this jury or to tell a juror his or her view of the evidence in this case. You will be permitted to separate during recesses and in the evening. During your absence, the courtroom will be locked. You are to return following the recess and following the evening recess on the next succeeding court day. During periods of recess you must not discuss with anyone any subject connected with this trial, and you must not deliberate further upon the case until all twelve of you are together and reassembled in the jury room. At that time you shall notify the clerk or bailiff that the jury has reassembled and then continue your deliberations. As to the alternate jurors, you are still bound by the admonition that you are not to converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this trial or to form or express any opinion on this until the case is submitted to you, which means until such time as you are substituted in for one of the twelve jurors not deliberating on the case. 
This also means that you are not to decide how you would vote if you were deliberating with the other jurors. Now, we have quite a bit of evidence accumulated behind the clerk there. What I'm going to ask you to do, the 12 of you who are going to start deliberations, is to go into the jury room and select your foreperson. Once the foreperson has been selected, notify the bailiff, and then we will have the evidence brought to the jury room. The foreperson will be responsible for keeping the evidence in its numerical order, in the boxes, so that it will be easy for the staff to ascertain that all the evidence is there at the end of each deliberating period. For the alternates, we are going to call you when the jury advises us that they have reached verdicts, and give you the opportunity to come back and sit in the audience and hear the verdict. We will allow a little over an hour. I know some of you don't live in this community. We'll give you time, but we're not going to be waiting beyond. If we called your home or the number that you've left us to call and you weren't there and you weren't available, we will not be looking for you or waiting for you. Do you understand? We will call and give you the opportunity to be here. I want to thank all of the alternates. You are not released. You understand that you may still be called if we had to replace a juror for any reason. It's very important that you keep the pledge that you've made and not talk to anyone until after the verdicts are returned. Judge, off the record discussion held between the bailiff and the court. For the jury that's going to be deliberating, you will deliberate during the normal hours that we were holding court, so from 8.30 to 2.30 will be your deliberations. I would like you to take your breaks at the same time as you were taking breaks. And there's a reason for this. It has nothing to do with you, but it has to do with the whole rest of the court. The reason we ran such a strict schedule was the other courtrooms have to shut down. So many things happen that are not you, it's the rest of the whole system that we have to rely on. They have to rely on us operating on a certain time zone to take care of their ongoing business. So I'd appreciate it if you would do that. All right, I'm going to allow all of you to go out this way, because I assume that some of the alternates have personal belongings that they need to pick up. And then after the alternates have departed, then you may start your deliberations. Judge, you need to swear the bailiff. All right, would you swear the bailiff, please? Do you and each of you solemnly swear that you will keep the jury together in a private and convenient place, and do not speak to them or to allow anyone else to do so, except to ask them if they have agreed upon a verdict, and to return them into court when they have done so or upon the instructions of the court, so help you God. I do. I do. Thank you. Whereupon, the jury retired to its deliberations at 12.20 p.m. Counsel. A couple of items. Number one. I need you to be available within 10 minutes of the court in case there's a request for information from the jury or instructions. I need you to give your phone number to the clerk where you will be during the deliberations. Keep her informed of your phone number of where you are at all times during the deliberations. Mr. Jackson, I have no problem with you being at your residence on Figueroa Mountain. Mr. Mesero, is an hour sufficient time for him to come for a verdict? I think so, Your Honor. Yes, yes, it is, Your Honor. If you were slightly delayed, I would rather be slightly delayed than to be, you know, have you rushed too fast? But I want, that is a reasonable time? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, is there an agreement with the attorneys that if, after the, if the jury requests that testimony be reread, that after we meet and agree on what should be read to them, that the court reporter may go into the jury room and read the material, the requested material? Your Honor, I would say that we would probably agree to that, but I'd like to reserve that until we have the discussion, which we would have anyway. I would assume it would be okay but I'd like to know what it's about. All right. It's fine with us. All right. Is there any matter either side would like to take up at this time? Judge, I would like to know what the procedure is going to be at the end of the day at 2.30. Do you require counsel to be present when the jury is discharged or do you intend to just let them go at that point with an admonition? I would request that counsel stipulate that the jury can convene and reconvene without your presence my presence and without further admonition. Yes. That's fine on our part, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. 
and if there is any request to change their hours, I will notify everybody as soon. What I'm thinking of is that they might ask on a particular day to come in later or to leave early or something. I know some graduations are going to be taking place. Some of the jurors have undoubtedly might ask for that time. But if something like that happens, I'll inform you so you know you don't have to remain available during a period when you're not needed. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, is there anything else? No, Your Honor. No, sir. This court is in recess.